guys sound amazing. The title of our lesson this morning is Like a Rock. And no, we're not going to be talking about Chevy trucks. And no, we're not going to be talking about some of the brothers' physique right here. Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 1 and verse 35. evangelistic and so he brings Simon to Jesus and Jesus goes you know you're not gonna be called Simon anymore you're gonna be called Cephas or Peter which means the rock you know it's amazing uh, this past week I got a chance to celebrate with my wife our nine-year anniversary yeah. now if you know me and you know my wife that's quite an accomplishment and uh, we had an awesome time. Uh, my wife loves Vietnamese food, and so we went and had some pho uh, down at one of the Vietnamese spots by our house. And then we, we got to go hang out and have some coffee, and it was great to just get away from the kid for just a little bit. And uh, I, I, it kind of reminded me, as I was spending time with my wife, a story I heard about a, uh, wi our husband and his wife. And he was a CEO, and she was just sort of a stay-at-home mom. And so they were driving on vacation, and they got to a gas station, and, you know, he, he went inside to pay. And while he went inside to, to pay, the wife struck up a conversation with the gas attendant, the gas station attendant. And so he's over there filling up the car, and they're talking and things like that. And the husband notices that she's talking to him uh, as he's looking out the window of this place that he's at. And so he comes outside and uh, gets back in the car with his wife, and he goes, hey, I noticed that you were speaking to the gas station attendant. She goes, yeah, it's amazing. I used to date that guy in high school. He goes, wow, good thing you married a guy like me. Because you married a CEO, and if you hadn't married me, you would have dated a gas station attendant. She goes, no, 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 no. If I would have married him, he would have been the CEO, and you would be the gas station attendant. <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways, I think my relationship with my wife is kind of like that. But more so than that, that's what it's like when you marry Jesus. We're nothing special when we come into the kingdom of God. But you marry Jesus, and all of a sudden he goes, hey, you can be Peter the Rock. Jesus has vision for our lives. And Jesus has vision for your life. Notice, he says, you will be called Peter. So he was not Peter quite yet. Let's turn to Matthew 16. Right here, Jesus' ministry is well underway, and he's going from city to city, and he's preaching the word, and he's healing people and baptizing people, and they're doing a lot of different things, but he's trying to keep his identity somewhat secret because he knows that once people find out who he is, they're going to put him on the cross. And so now he's starting to reveal himself, and people are starting to figure it out, and so he comes 
to Caesarea Philippi right here in verse 13, chapter 16 of Matthew. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You know, right here, Jesus wants to get a feel for what people are saying about him. So he goes, okay, guys, what are, what are people saying about me? You know, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist was like a super hardline preacher. People are coming out to be baptized, and he goes, look, the ax is at the root of the trees. It's ready to cut you down unless you repent. He goes, some people think that you're kind of like Elijah, the miracle worker. You work all these different miracles, and you, you have all these different signs, and that's kind of how Elijah was. So maybe you're the Elijah reborn. And yet some people go, you're like Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet. You're emotional. You feel your ministry. But he goes, okay, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? And the guy who speaks up is the guy who usually has nothing good to say when he speaks up in situations like this. And he goes, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. And Jesus goes, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by God. You know, very interestingly, in Exodus in the Old Testament, in chapter 20, verse 25, when the Israelites were told to make altars, God instructs them to make it from stones that were uncut by man or unfashioned by man. Because if something's to be built as an altar of God, it's got to be from natural stones or from stones that God himself made, not something that we've defiled ourselves. And so right here when Jesus says, this was revealed to you not by man, but by God. He's saying, hey, you're the rock that God has fashioned. You're the rock that no man has changed, that God has made you who you are, the rock. You know, I remember a story of Michelangelo. When he was carving out from a granite, one of his most famous works of art, the statue of David. And some bystander was there, and he goes, man, how do you, how do, you do this? How do you, how do you make David from this big old rock? He goes, well, it's very simple. I take this rock, and I just chip away everything that's not David. And eventually, David pops out. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what God does with us. He sees what we can be. And he spends our lives chipping away at us until we become the rock that he wants us to become. I've got four points for us this morning. Number one, Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Our first point is because Jesus said so. Do you need to say anything beyond that? Yeah. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Here we find Peter's calling. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him, listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down. And taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. We'll stop right there. You know, right here, this is one of many accounts in the Bible where Jesus' disciples are fishing before they're called. And, uh, you know, it never records them catch anything, so I don't think they're ever any good at fishing, but that's what they did. And so here, here Jesus comes, and he walks along the shore, and he, he sees them, and they're already putting their nets away. They're already cleaning up their boats. And the Bible records that Jesus just kind of goes and makes his way over to the boat and just sits right there in the boat. And that had to be kind of annoying for Peter. I mean, he's trying to put it all away, he's trying to get rid of the boat, trying to get rid of everything, all his equipment and things like that. And all of a sudden, Jesus just gets himself in the way. And Jesus goes, hey, I want you to take the boat out. Takes the boat out, offshore. And then Jesus preaches a sermon from the boat. You go, why, why the boat? That's because in the old days, they didn't have sound systems. And your voice carries really well over water. And so if you put yourself offshore a little bit, 
now you have this projector, natural creation from God to project your voice. And so he preaches a sermon, and then after his sermon gets done, he goes, okay, it's time to fish. That's true for every sermon that's preached. When the sermon's done, it's time to fish. Amen, guys? Not for fish, but for men. And so he goes, hey, Peter, I want you to take it the butt out a little bit deeper, and let's put down our nets. He goes, but Jesus, I've been working hard all night. I'm tired. I just listened to your sermon. I want to go home. I want to go to Burger King. But because you say so, I will put down my nets. Peter puts down the nets, and the Bible records that they take such a catch that he had to signal another boat to come and help him. And they still both almost sank. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. You know, the only reason we need to do anything is because Jesus said so. Bless you. So often we think that we're, it's somebody else's job to motivate us to do something right. Or, or, or I've heard some people go, you know, if, if we didn't have heaven waiting for us, I'd still live the life of a disciple because it's such an awesome life. And that is true to a certain degree. Being a disciple is awesome. The things that the Bible commands us to do are there for a reason and a purpose. And I think it often has our, our best interest in mind. That said, even if life didn't get better as a disciple, we'd still have to obey because Jesus said so. You know, I think oftentimes we confuse motivation for toleration. We say things like, I'm just not motivated to do that. I need somebody to push me a little bit. Well, the Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 17 that those who know the good they ought to do and don't do it, sins. So to not do what God tells us to do is sin. It's wrong. It doesn't matter how you feel because our feelings don't really, they change. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible says heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it. We, we feel one way one day, we feel another thing another day, and, and if you go by your feelings, you can't be a disciple. In fact, the very thing that Jesus says to be a disciple is to deny yourself. And it takes self-denial to obey despite how you feel. But yet so often we go, well, I'm just not motivated to go share my faith. I just don't feel motivated to go and study out the Bible more. I don't feel motivated to be sacrificial. No, your issue is not motivation. It's Jesus said so is not enough for you. And you give in to toleration of your sin. And so I've got to ask, is because Jesus said so enough for you personally? Or are you just hoping for something extra to come and push you along? Let's read on right here and find out what happens. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. And I think we see Peter's heart. He's so shocked that the Messiah would be right there in the boat with him. Would have given him all these different fish. And so he falls to his knees and he goes, away from me. I don't deserve for you to be in this boat with me. For I am a sinful man. And Jesus goes, hey, get up. From now on, you're going to catch men. You know, recently it's been pretty cool. I found out that they put the Bible series up on Netflix. And the only thing we have in our house is we have Netflix on our TV. So, so that's, if we watch it, we watch Netflix. And so I decided, oh, i got a couple minutes right here. I'm going to check out the Bible series. And I happened to turn to the episode where this story was occurring in the Bible. And uh, it's amazing how they did it in the story. I mean, it's, it's somewhat accurate. But, of course, they, they have to make it so that you can watch it. And so they paraphrase a lot and change a lot of stuff in it. But it's still cool. So I was watching the story. And the, the way he has it in the story is pretty amazing. Jesus looks at Peter and he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. And Peter's just there with his nets, and he looks up and goes, what are we going to do? And Jesus looks up back at him, and he says, change the world. Someone who has the heart to do things because Jesus said so is someone who can change the world. Who can become a rock. Who can be what God has called him to be. But you've got to give up everything. And the Bible says, consequently, right there at this point, Peter leaves everything and follows Jesus. You know, last week was really awesome. 
Brandon and Rochelle had their brother and sister-in-law uh, here at church. And they were visiting down from Palm Springs, and that's where they live. And Brandon and Rochelle are gone today because they're actually going up there to see them get baptized. Yeah. And so that's encouraging. We're going to have a new brother and sister in the kingdom up in Palm Springs today. Amen, guys? Yeah. And so being that he was Brandon's brother-in-law, and uh, he heard that I had been a disciple for some time, so he comes up to me after church last week, and he goes, hey, Evan. Hey, so you've been a disciple for a while. I said, yeah, I've been a disciple for about 13 years. He goes, okay, awesome, cool. Well, hey, I want to get your advice. What do you think I need to know if I'm going to become a disciple? And I said, oh, it's, that's, that's simple. It just comes down to one thing. He goes, really, just one thing? I go, yeah, just one thing. He goes, what is it? I go, oh, it's everything. <laughs> you know what's funny? Every time I've studied the Bible with somebody, it always just comes down to one thing. The heart to give up everything. And when you can give up everything, there is nothing that will hold you back. And right here, that's why Peter leaves everything to follow Jesus. Because Jesus said so. And because Jesus had called him to fish for men. Our second point is found in Matthew chapter 14. Get out of the boat. Matthew chapter 14. In verse 22. The Bible says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was a considerable distance away from land. Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come out on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. He said, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down so that those there in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. You know, uh, no matter when you read the story, how many times you read the story, th this had to be one of the most incredible things that ever happened in Peter's life. I mean, for all time, he's the only guy to ever have walked on water. I remember a girl tried once in Hilo, and she, she bought for herself new shoes because she thought if she bought new shoes, then that meant she had a lot of faith. And she took one step and boom, her foot went right to the bottom. <laughs> Nobody's ever done it. He's the only one to do it. And still Jesus goes, you have little faith. But right here they see Jesus walking in the water, convinced it was a ghost. I mean, that was the most logical conclusion. Yet when they get a little closer, or when Jesus gets a little closer, closer rather, they go, hey, Jesus, if it's you, Tell me to come out to you. And Jesus just simply says, hey, come. And the Bible says that Peter had the courage, he had the faith to step out of the boat. And he, to this day, is the only guy who's ever walked on water besides Jesus. You know, some people say, this wasn't Peter's faith that did this. This was Jesus' faith. That's why nobody can do it today because, you know, they don't have enough faith. Jesus isn't here to do it with us. Well, if it was Jesus' faith, then I tell you that Peter probably wouldn't have sunk. And so that means that this was Peter's faith that allowed him to walk on water. What an amazing thing. Yeah, I always find myself wondering what the conversation was like when he got back into the boat. Bro, like, dude, what were you thinking? Dude, you like sunk like a rock out there. Yeah, but shut up, dude. At least I got out of the boat. <laughs> Let me ask you as a disciple. Are you someone who gets out of the boat and goes for glory? Or do you stay where it's safe because you're worried about sinking? You know, I think that we do have to distinguish. There's a difference between getting out of the boat and jumping ship. We're not saying you should jump ship as a disciple. The implication of jumping ship is that when a ship is going down, you jump from an uncomfortable situation to a comfortable situation. We're talking about the opposite right here. Jumping from a comfortable situation to an uncomfortable lifestyle. Walking on water. 
taking all the comfort of your boat, choosing to get out there in the wind and the waves, purely on faith. And I forget, one of my favorite movies is Tombstone. And you know, there's that one part in the movie where Wyatt Earp is just taking on this bunch of bad guys, and they got ambushed, and there's all these people in the bushes shooting at him, and he just gets his gun, he just gets ticked off. And he gets his gun, he starts walking in the water, and he just goes, no, boom, no, boom, no, boom, boom, boom. And he just shoots all these bad guys. Nobody, gets, nobody shoots him, nobody even comes close. And then later they talk to uh, Doc Holliday, and they go, hey, where's Wyatt? Doc Holliday goes, down by the creek bed, walking on water. Let me ask you, what's the most radical thing you've done lately? What's the most radical thing you've done lately? Oh, I had a quiet time. Well, congratulations. That's step one of being a disciple. Amen. I went to Bible talk. Well, thank God you did, because if you didn't, you'd be in sin. I shared my faith. Well, hey, let me clap. That's awesome. Where's the radicalness? Where's the lifestyles like Jesus? Where's the heart to give up everything? Where's the heart to go anywhere, to do whatever it takes, to win even just one soul for God's kingdom? Guys, I think it's time for us to start jumping out of the boat. Because it's only when you jump out of the boat that you can walk on water. Point three. If you want to be the rock, you've got to let Jesus wash you. Let's turn to John chapter 13. John 13, verse 1. The kids are having a really good time over there, I can assure you. John chapter 13, verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Let's just stop right there. The Bible says Jesus is well aware at this point that he's about to go to the cross. He knows what kind of death is waiting for him. And being that it was time for him to leave this world, he, he, he puts together what I call his bucket list. Just, just one thing on the bucket list. He wants to show his disciples the full extent of his love. I mean, what would you put on your bucket list? This is what he decided to do before he died. Verse 2. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up in the meal, took off his cut of clothing, and wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. The Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head and my back. You just scratch me all over. Just get me clean. <laughs> Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. The whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For I knew who was going to betray him, and that he was, that's why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I am the Lord and teacher, I have washed your feet. You should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. What an amazing story. Jesus here, sensing the time is near. The Bible says he's there at the meal. They just get done, and so he's, he's got a full stomach. It's hard to get up when you've got a full stomach. And he gets up, and he takes the towel off from around him, which is probably a, a big sheet or a toga of sorts. And, and he puts it down, and he, he just grabs a bucket, and he begins washing his disciples' feet. Now, I think for us, we don't really understand the magnitude of what's happening right here, because we've, we've heard this story before, and, you know, maybe it's not beyond our culture right here, but for, for this group of people right here, this blew their minds. Rabbis in the New Testament could ask their disciples to do anything except remove their shoes and wash feet. A rabbi could ask Jewish slaves to do anything, except wash people's slaves or feet. A rabbi could ask a Gentile to do anything. And so Jesus right here, by washing people's feet, taking off his towel, removing their shoes, is putting himself in the lowest of lows when it comes to servanthood. And so now I think we can understand the horror of Peter. Jesus, are you planning to wash my feet? No! 
you can't do that. You can't wash my, you're the Savior. You're the Son of God. Remember, that's what I told you. That's what God revealed to me. You can't go down and wash my feet. And Jesus goes, well, unless I wash you, you really have no part. Well, dude, then wash my feet, wash my head, wash my hair, get it good. Dude, I just want to wash your feet. Sit down and shut up. You know, right here, Jesus is making a reference to him washing Peter. And most scholars would equate that to Christian baptism. And that to be washed by God is to be forgiven and cleansed. And so he says right here, hey, you, you've already been cleansed. You only need to wash your feet. You, you've already been cleansed spiritually. You just need a physical bath right here or a physical washing. And that's why he said that Judas was not clean because Judas was not saved at this point. He had been prompted by Satan, so he fell away from God. And so right here, Jesus is talking about being forgiven. You know, I think sometimes as disciples, one of the hardest things is not to be forgiven by God, but to feel forgiven by God. And there's a difference. The Bible says if you've repented of your sins and you've been baptized, you're forgiven. That's awesome. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, the Bible says, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So God not only forgives your sin, he doesn't even remember. You know, hey, God, remember that time when I was, you know, I'm really sorry about the, the stuff I got myself into. He goes, what stuff? Oh, uh, just forget. It's fine. God doesn't even remember our sins. But sometimes we don't forgive ourselves, and so we put this heavy lot of guilt on ourselves. We, uh, Oh, I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. I'm so dumb. And we fight this battle within ourselves. And I think for us, we need not only to be forgiven, but we need to make sure that we strive to think of ourselves as forgiven. Amen, guys? Yes. Well, let's read on in chapter 13, verse 36. Right. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Wow. Right after Jesus had washed Peter's feet, he goes, hey, Lord, where are you going? Remember, Jesus had prophesied about his own death. He goes, well, where I'm going, you can't go, but you're going to go later on. And Peter goes, I will lay down my life for you. Really? Really, Peter? You know, I was going to tell you about that. In fact, tonight, you're going to hear the rooster crow, and at that time, you're going to deny me three times. Th this reference right here to the rooster crowing is actually what's called in this time the cock crow hour. It occurred from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. on the third watch of the night. So essentially, Jesus is giving Peter the time that he's going to fall away from him. This is this exact time, and you're going to say, you'd think that he'd be a little prepared for that. Okay, around 12 o'clock right here. Yeah, I'm just going to be tempted about then to deny Jesus. So good thing I had a good quiet time. I feel ready to go right here. But in his own arrogance, he didn't even prepare. And so we pick it up in chapter 22 of Luke, verse 54. Peter's already, or Jesus has already been arrested. And it says, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, now that the fire is illuminating his face, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in a the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Now, could you just imagine? Not your finest hour. Some could say the rock was rock bottom. Here he denies Jesus three times, first time to a girl, not even just a serving girl. And the third time he denied him, instantly the cock crowed. And then it just so happened at that very moment, Jesus' face turned and looked right at him. Wow. 
You know, I think one of the most interesting studies is to compare Peter to Judas. And oftentimes when we study the Bible with people, we, we try to help them to understand this concept. Peter denies Jesus right here. A few verses later, we find that Judas has betrayed Jesus and has betrayed him for just 30 pieces of silver. And most people go, man, what a loser. I mean, that guy just totally betrayed Jesus. That guy is like the most evil man that has ever existed on the planet. I mean, nobody even wants to name their kids Judas. Jesus' brother was named Judas, and then they changed it to Jude, and now that's the, the book right before the Revelation in the Bible. Because you don't want to call somebody Judas. When's the last time you met somebody named Judas? How about Peter? There's a lot of Peters. We even have a Peter right here. But what's the difference? Whose sin was greater? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so their sins are equal in the eyes of God. What was the difference? Judas felt so bad, beat himself up. I can never be forgiven. I've done it. I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm over. I, I'm Went off and killed himself. Whereas Peter struggled to get back on his feet, but through fighting for his relationship with God, he stayed faithful and died as a disciple. And so, consequently, Peter's sin was bad, but he's still going to be in heaven. Judas' sin was bad, but he's not going to be in heaven. It's how we respond in our failures. And I think for us, we need to, if we're going to be the rock, let Jesus wash you. Lastly, our fourth point, follow till you die. John 21. John 21, verse 1, or verse 4. At this point, Jesus has resurrected from the dead, and we find that the disciples have gone back to fishing. This was a complete reversal of what God had called them to, but they had totally drifted away from the, their relationship with God and returned to their old life. And so in verse 4, it says, early in the morning. Early in the morning. Amen, campus and sisters, brothers and sisters. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, the answer. Well, what a shocker. <laughs> what are the chances? You haven't caught in fish the last 15 times you went fishing, but hey, maybe there's a, there's a change right here. Verse 6. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Like as if they're just huddled right there. <laughs> Not the wrong side, the right side of the boat. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large amount of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. And the disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. That's a good discipling time right here. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. You know, right here. As Peter has gone back to fishing, has fallen away, and still couldn't catch anything, Jesus comes and he goes, hey, throw your net on the other side of the boat. They take in such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And instantly the disciples knew this was Jesus. See, Jesus called them here the same way he called them the first time because he wanted them to remember their first love, remember the height from which they had fallen. It's interesting, and the Bible records the number of fish right here is 153. Some have suggested at this time that there was known to be 153 species of fish. And so, I don't know, maybe it was just one of each type of fish, you know, just a big mixture. And that's kind of how the kingdom of God is. 
Who knows if that's true or not? That's just kind of cool. But I do know this. John wrote the book of John about 70 years later from this time. And he remembered the exact number of fish. 153. Never forget. Then Jesus goes on to restore Peter. And I think it's important for us to understand that there are four different words for love in the Greek. There's eros, which is the erotic sexual type of love that's not used in the entire New Testament. There's thorge, which is a natural love like for a family. There's phileo, which is a friendship type of love. And then there's agape, which is unconditional commitment type of love. And Jesus uses some of these words interchangeably through these scriptures. In fact, he says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Do you truly agape me? Are you committed to me more than these, the fish, the nets, the boats? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I phileo you. I'm your friend. Jesus says again, Simon, son of John, do you truly agape me? Simon goes, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I'm your friend. The third time, Jesus asks, and the Bible records at this point, Simon's pretty hurt. Notice Jesus doesn't use the word Peter because he stopped being the rock. He's hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, of course, to indicate that, hey, you denied me three times. Now you need to reaffirm your faith three times. And so he asks him one final time, Simon, son of John, do you, not agape, phileo me? Are you even my friend? And Peter was hurt, but he answers, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He still couldn't say agape. He still couldn't say that he loved God unconditionally. He wasn't going to make that mistake again. But at this point, he's restored. The tradition goes that Peter would later go to Rome to preach to the Roman world, the most influential empire on earth at that time. And while he was in Rome, he would be captured. And he was forced to make a decision, a choice. The Romans put his wife next to a cross and said, if you do not deny Jesus, we're going to crucify your wife in front of you. And the Bible records that Peter let her be crucified. And then they go, hey, Peter, deny Jesus or you're going to get crucified. He says, fine, crucify me. But I can't do it the way Jesus did. Let's, let's do it upside down. And Peter historically was crucified upside down. In the 80s, there was a musical made, and at the end of the story, it ends with this story, with, with him watching his wife crucified and her encouraging him not to give up, not to deny Jesus, but to stay faithful to the end. And the words of her song go like this to Peter from Abbey. Don't you dare even give a thought of saving me today. I'm already saved, and for that gift... There's no price I wouldn't pay. Get behind me, Satan. The devil's last chance slips away. God won't have our lives ignored. Simon, remember the Lord. And of course, throughout the whole story, she calls him Simon. And in the last verse of the song, she doesn't call him Simon anymore, but Peter. She says, Peter, God won't have our lives ignored. Remember the Lord. Peter responds by song. He says, I remember my Lord. I remember my Lord. I remember walking on the water. I remember when he gave me my name. I remember entering the city. I will never, ever, ever deny my Lord. And then all of a sudden this rooster crows. What an amazing story. To be faithful all the way to the end. In the entire New Testament, after John 21 right there, when he was restored, Peter was never referred to as Simon again, but always Peter the Rock. You know, today, guys, I want to challenge us. If you want to be built like a rock, spiritually speaking, not physically. Some of us have already lost that opportunity. <laughs> then number one, you need to do things because Jesus said so. Number two is you've got to be willing to get out of the boat. Number three, you've got to allow Jesus to wash you. And number four, you need to follow till you die. And then and only then can God make your life the rock that he promises to make you. God bless you all. Love you guys.